What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week, kicking it off with The Death of Doctor Strange, number one from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art uh. by Lee Garbett. Tell you what, given the Jed McKay of all of all, I shouldn't have been surprised that this was as fun as it was. I was a little trepidatious because another death of a superhero. There's a little bit of a twist there, but at the same time, uh, good stuff. Very fun. I had a blast reading this book. Justin, what about you? I love Jed McKay. I've been really enjoying his Black Cat book uh, for, uh, like, I guess a year or so now. And this is a fun book. Like, uh, you, you, this book does a great job of scooping up all of Doctor Strange's continuity from older stuff, his uh, relationship with Clea, his, uh, I believe, is the photograph he keeps looking at. Um, we see Bats, the ghost dog. We see uh, the fact that he has his hands back uh, in the modern continuity. Strange Academy, an ongoing book. Like, it, it just, it, it's a fun story, and I'm excited to keep reading it. Pete, what about you? Yeah, I think it's a great start. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested. I was happy with the kind of the comedy aspect of it. Um, uh, yeah, the, Doctor Strange has done a lot of different ways, but um, you know, I like Doctor Strange when he's got a sense of humor and it has a little lightness to him. I really, the dug the panels where he's got his foot in the, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, he's putting his feet up and kind of, but they're like ghost tentacles that are massaging him, so it's weird. But yeah, I, I think it's just fun. You like Doctor Strange the comedian? Yeah, yeah, definitely Doctor Strange the comedian. All right, fair enough. Why don't we move on to another highly anticipated comic here? Aquaman the Becoming, number one from DC Comics, written by Brandon Thomas, art by Diego Olartuga. This is focusing on the new Aquaman, previously Aqualad, now training up to be Aquaman. Uh, it is part of the DC Pride initiative, so we get a little bit of a gay romance going on here, which is nice and fun to see. Uh, what do you think about this book? Uh, obviously, this is a character that I think we've enjoyed reading from the future state books, but what's your guess? Yes. I thought this was a really solid first issue. I thought it was great art, uh, well done introduction to this kind of like character taking on a bigger mantle, a bigger role. Uh, I think this was a really good kind of starting point. Um, I had a lot of different aspects to kind of keep you coming back for more. I really was impressed. Uh, I loved the Aquaman Future State book. Um, I believe it was only two issues, but just really letting this character run, it was a great story. And if we can start to move toward that, I think it's great. I thought this issue sort of laid out, uh, like we got to explore the character a bit and it laid out some, some interesting details. I'm curious to see what the world of this character is because it feels very rooted in, uh, old Aquaman stuff. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Like Under a the fish, sea, fish. Like a fish that's been in the fridge for a little too long. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, old Aquaman. Oh, oh, no thanks. Next up, Frontiersman number one from Image Comics, written by Patrick Kindlin, art by Marco Ferrari. In this book, uh, we should probably actually mention we talked to them <laughs> on the live show, Marco yes. and Patrick. Very fun interview. Very fun guys to talk to. But the idea of this book is that there is a old timey superhero who has been called back into action once more. And yeah, there you go. Uh, what do you guys think about this book? Let's be honest now that they're not. Yeah, they're not listening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they actually are listening. I have them <laughs> on, uh, on the, the phone here with me. It's not smart. That's not a good way to do that. Well, what did you think, Justin? What did you actually think about this book? Uh, I really like this. I said this on the on the podcast, um, on the live show. Like, I feel like they really established the world and then really opened uh, let, opened it up in a very organic way. So the, we got to know that there was a great backstory to this character as well as having following this superhero who's sort of given up on the world and then is maybe being pulled back in by the uh, by the socially conscious um, young people that he's encountering over the course of the story. Beautiful art by Marco, sort of a watercolor vibe to it. I thought it was great. Yeah, I really love the art. I thought this was a solid kind of first issue. Uh, very interesting character, cool take. Um, I I'm interested. Uh, I want more. I thought, uh, you know, I, I was very truthful in our interview. I, I appreciated kind of what they're struggling with and how they're presenting it. 
Um, so, yeah, I, th I think they're a very interesting team, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, how this comic is going to kind of move forward. This isn't exactly the same thing, but it almost felt to me like a black hammer in terms of this is oh, something that saying. could, if it is successful, launch an entire superhero line uh, yeah. in a very cool, weird, different way. So, yeah, like you guys are saying, very excited to follow this going forward. Moving on to Batman versus Big B, a Wolf in Gotham number one from DC Comics, written by Bill Willingham, art by Brian Level. This is Bill Willingham, of course, returning to the Fables universe, this time with Big B Wolf in Gotham, tracking down a criminal, as you can tell from the title, brings him face to face with Batman. Pete, you're pumping your fist in excitement. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we got the return of uh, Big Willie Styles here. It, it's great to see him That's what kind of back uh, <laughs> on kind of in the Fable scene, uh, his legendary run on Fables. So I thought this was a cool kind of mix. I thought for our first issue, they did a great job of giving us this kind of cast of characters. Um, yeah, I love the art. Um, Big Willie, he, he brings the story, so I'm on board. Uh, that guy uh, writes really well and does interesting stuff, so I'm excited uh, that uh, he's back in action. Big Willie is, of course, Bill Willingham you're talking about. Right. Well, I thought you were talking, oh, about, you were talking Big about Big B. B. Wolf, yeah. the character. Yeah. Nope. Uh, but as we know, Big B. Wolf is um, children's Wolverine, the Wolverine for kids. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Stop doing that. Nope. I did really like, I will say, I did really like the villains here. They felt very crossover between Gotham and Fables. There were a bunch of criminals who were super into yeah. books, and they all use literary names as their aliases. Assume, uh, I assume it is the al aliases, which really straddles that line between weird Gotham villains and weird Fable villains, which I thought was a nice touch. I agree. I will say this issue focused so much on the villains and Batman. I am very excited to see um, just more Bill Willingham writing Bigby Wolf. And so, like, that's, I feel like we're going to get that in this next issue, hopefully. Um, so, definitely looking forward to that. Just seeing the first page of this comic reminded me how much I miss Fables. I thought it was, yeah. it was great. And I kind of miss. Uh, Mark Buckingham, nothing against Brian Level's art that I thought was very good and appropriate to Black Label, but in the style, yeah. But that was so iconic to Fables; it was a bummer not to see him on that. But it is what it is. Let's move on and talk about Alien Number Seven from Marvel, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Salvatore Larca. After the game-changing. I think first arc of this book, just in terms of adding extra mythology to Alien, we're now on to a second arc with presumably new characters. Same old Alien, though. Things go wrong with a xenomorph. A ship comes crashing. Same but this time, old same old classic same old. Alien. But here we get a planet that, through their religion, has broken off from Earth. They've forgone technology. They're getting ready to shut it all down. And as they shut it down, of course xenomorphs spoiler crash onto their planet um i think what i what i what i really like about this is philip Kenny johnson is in his element dealing with big ideas like religion and i'm excited to see where this arc goes it's funny reading this i was like oh alien always encounters religion or uh, at least recently it, it counters religion in a weird way and i i think that's such an interesting idea uh why i don't know why but I really like this issue. I think um, the main character we're meeting here who is in this religion, um, as they've terraformed this planet, and she could have bailed on her religion to save her life because she has a degenerative disease, I thought was just a, just a great little meditation on what this character is going through. And it made all of the sort of classic alien plot points feel fresh uh, because yeah. the characters are, are different and unique. I, I agree. This is kind of a, you know, PKJ is just killing it. I think that, like, this is a kind of a fun exploration of the alien world. And uh, I like this kind of, like, new arc. The art is just absolutely fantastic, especially around the, the kind of alien creatures. So uh, I, I, I like this setup. I think they, uh, you know, t took a big swing here, and I'm very interested to see how this pays off. Very cool start to this uh, new arc. Next up, King Spawn, number two from Image Comics, written by Sean Lewis and Todd McFarlane, art by Javi Fernandez. 
we, well, I, I'll speak for myself. I was blown away by the first issue of this book. Yeah, this is Zalvin's pick. I love you're, it. Well, you're I, a Spawn head. I yeah, love Spawn. Spawn I've always loved Spawn. I've read every issue of Spawn, and I've talked about it incessantly. And Pete is like, whoa, whoa, stop talking about Spawn, buddy. <laughs> no, this was, King Spawn number one was the first Spawn issue that I really loved in a very long time. I thought it was a bold reinvention of the franchise. Now that Spawn is the leader of hell investigating this new mystery, here we find out more about what is going on with this cult that seems to both be worshiping and pushing spawn again i thought this was really well characterized i thought the situations are interesting i think the support staff for spawn that he has going on is interesting mm. as well and I, I like this i think this is a really strong series so far justin as the fellow spawn doubter on the podcast what'd you think about this one I agree with you. I did enjoy this. I like the way they're positioning it as we, I feel like a lot of Spawn history has been about him being like, yeah, I'm dead. Uh, my wife. What am I doing? Hey, dude, come on. Cut up the slack. If that Spawn, happened to you, very famously you for his catchphrase, fucking... my wife. 100%. Dude, Justin, uh, all you would do is complain about your, you know, your family if that happened to you. If I was about no, I would be like, ooh, what's this clock? Let me explore this clock. and be like, can I take some of these chains off? I'm sick of being so loud when I walk anywhere. Clink, Those are my two big scones. Cool, bro. Clink, clink, chains are clink. cool. I like that this comic is focusing less on the chains. And do you more think on... when Spawn and Ghost Rider kiss, their mm -hmm. chains get caught together? Pete, uh, over to you. In, in the style of braces. No, way. I do have a question, though. And Kissing actually brings it up. Did Spawn always have a mouth? In this comic, he's like his mouth opens. I thought he didn't have a mouth. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times they don't show it because it's in shadow. But, yeah, he has a mouth. He's always huh. in shadow? No, I thought that was sort of a mask. And he would take the mask off and, like, drink coffee or whatever. But now he just has a mouth. <laughs> it's not really. No, it's not really a mask. My favorite scenes in the original spawn comics were always when he would drink some coffee yeah he was thirsty a lot because he was in hell yeah. and he was like what am i doing my like, wife oh, i'm working oh. so hard anyways i got I, these I, I got these reports i gotta turn in i need some coffee uh, I, I yeah I'm, I'm enjoying this i think uh you know this is a lot of fun it's great to see kind of an old bad guy back um but i think that uh you know <coughs> guys uh Cults are bad, people. Stop joining cults. Like, what the fuck, you know? Totally agree with that. That's, That's a great the message point, here. Now, I would say, I don't know about you guys, but I, I find that I... <laughs> there we go. Drag it out, drag it out. <laughs> no, no, don't drag it out, but I just want to, like, really get in. Really get in, you know? <laughs> just get in the pilot seat and drive this truck all the way to Manscaped Town. Yeah, you know, well, you guys know how Spawn is always in the nether regions of hell, right? Yeah, Are yeah. you finding that you're spawning too much in your own nether regions? If so, what? you're probably going to want to look for Manscaped's performance package. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that comes with a ton of awesome things. You get the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. The yep. Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Tripper, the cool. Crop Reserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver nice. Toner, Performance wow. Boxer Briefs, a travel bag to hold everything in, and of wow. course, chains. Lots and lots of chains. <laughs> because here's the thing with this. This this trimmer has a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. And these are the kind of accidents that would send you straight to heck. You know what yeah. I'm talking about. Listen, guys. You don't want to be a violator, right? Oh, you wow. want to, nice. you want to get all trim and nice and good looking for whoever your significant other is or potential significant other. You know what I'm talking and about. And if if you happen to be trapped in hell, what you're going to need are things like a seven thousand RPM motor, which is a, a lot of RPMs for hell. A new multifunction on and off switch with a travel lock, because you know if you're in hell, there's going to be people always poking around with your technology and you don't want that yeah. and of course a 4000k led spotlight to the spotlight shine on the, the demons that are tormenting you absolutely don't be a clown come on get the performance package 4.0 you're gonna get all of these amazing things in there like the weed whacker which is a 360 degree rotary dual blade system and many that's more all things. the degrees that's, that's all, the, way all the degrees and listen you're gonna spawn whole new relationships 
wow. right out of this. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code fansided20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code fansided20 at manscaped.com. For a clean trinity and beyond, your space balls will thank you. And of course, as we know, we're talking about space spawn there as the thing that we're teeing sure. up. Exactly. Moving on to once and future number 20 for Boom Studios, written by oh, Kieran Gillen and yeah. art by Dan Mora. In this issue, we're dealing with the huge, amazing revelation of the last issue that if there is an Arthur and Merlin in this world that is generated of stories, if there are different versions of that story, of course, there are going to be other Arthurs and Merlins. They go up against each other. This issue with everybody call it in the crossfire. Pete, you love a badass grandma. Talk about this issue. This is just absolutely glorious. Absolutely glorious. The action, uh, you know, the kind of grandma talking it out moments. You know, I just uh, absolutely just fantastic. I love how not in touch with her emotion she is. That makes me very happy. Uh, I just think it's a... it's such a cool creative idea and uh, we're running through all these stories and having so much fun and the villain the villain reveal at the end was just so fantastic this book is just tons of fun it's just great the art's unbelievable why aren't you reading this what are you doing with your life justin wow over to uh, you it, uh <laughs> what are you doing with your life um I, I like this I like this book a lot as well. Um, I think it has that sort of stories about stories vibe to it, but I think they've moved on and put it into sort of roles or even like a feel has like a role playing game vibe where we're following these characters who are just playing out these roles that they just simply must uh, to try to get everything uh, moving forward in the right way. And it every issue has like just is just further playing out that premise. Lots of action. All the characters are very clear. And Pete, every time I read this, I just think about Pete kissing Grandma on the lips. What? Wait, what? <laughs> what was that? Pete kissing Grandma on the lips. In the book. The, the mom. What are you talking about? Pete kissing the fictional character of the grandma? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. I thought you were talking about your grandma or something. It got weird. No. Oh, yeah, that would be weird. Let's move on, talk about X-Men number three for Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by Pepe Larraz. In this issue, the X-Men are dealing with the high evolutionary, battling him and dealing with some other threats down the road, including a huge revelation by the end that may change everything for the X-Men. Now, Pete, I hesitate to go to you just because I know you've been so down on the X-Men, but... As we've been talking about, this is the action X-Men. This is the people who are being superheroes and out there. So how are you feeling about this one so far? I know you, you like the first issue, right? Well, yeah. So what's nice is we kind of like, uh, uh, first off, Dukes. The Dukes is a fantastic writer. You got to love the Dukes. Um, I, I, and what, we're not dealing with the Hump Island or anything like that. This is X-Men kind of out on missions, handling business that, you know, kind of trying to, trying to win the day. So I appreciate all that. It's just, um, you know, you got little moments there where you're still doing the kind of, you know, the stupid paneling shit and they make you read stuff. And, you know, what? it's just like still in this world that you want to get past. So, um, you know, if you're having fun, then this is great. You know, this is all great. But if you're like, Somebody like, I don't know, maybe me, uh, you want this to be over so you can get your X-Men back. But, hey, this is, you know, this is new and exciting, and people like that a lot. Pete, I hate to tell you, but this, if you hadn't, if this hadn't been part of the current X-Men uh, universe, the way it's being told, you would like this. This is the X-Men that you want. And it just happens to be it, at a time when you don't like the other stuff. Yeah, so it's tough, right? So oh, close. It's so yeah, close. Not, you can separate not really. it. You could separate it in your mind. You could separate oh, it mentally okay. because this is fun. Okay. Um, it feels so we there's sort of a, a reveal later on that maybe the X-Men are going to be changing up their teaming a little bit, which is cool. But my favorite part of what's going on in this book and sort of across the line is the relationship between Sink and Wolverine. Like I want to see uh, there's a, a great uh, one off story where 
um, Sink and Wolverine um, and Darwin were um, trapped in. I forget the name of the t- the world that they get sucked into. Where I think evolution it was the happened. world. I think it's the world. Yeah, <laughs> evolution happens uh, much faster, and they were there for like hundreds of years, and uh, like were a couple. And when they returned, they were killed there, and so their bodies were returned. He retained his memories. She did not, and they were together there and now they're not and i love the way this is playing out we could get a great almost pete rom-com moment here mm-hmm. where um he uh, she has to like get a little piece of his blood uh for a, a reason and i i think this is like maybe the most exciting relationship in the x-men universe right now Woo-hoo. i love wow. it Let's talk about Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, number four from DC Comics, written yes. by Tom King, art by <laughs> Bilquis Evely. I love this book. This is yes. great. In this issue, we continue to get Supergirl and her alien friend searching for the marauder, the bandit who hurt Crypto. They're traveling across the entire universe. As, as usual, this is just so well written, so good. The characters are so good. The things that... Tom King is saying about Supergirl are so good. And the art by Bilquis Avery is gorgeous. I it's, love it. The art's worth it alone. I mean, come on. This is just uh, come on. really, come on. really amazing art. I, I, I really, uh, Justin, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. I'm sorry. But uh, I just feel like this was... Justin, you sorry. Can't... Pete is going to jump in on himself talking. Yeah, I was okay, going to say, so... you can't jump in on yourself. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't give you a chance, so I'm sorry. Wait, what just happened? Sorry. <laughs> what are you doing? I guess you, I guess you, can't, you can not jump in on yourself. Yeah, but uh, I, I just felt like... Uh, I really love the things you that they're tackling. You have a pre-taped tackling. interview of your take on... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I really love the stuff that they're tackling... Uh, the like Superwoman kind of losing it, it with rage in the sun was really fucking awesome. Uh, yeah, I just it, it just doesn't stop. I, I really like the pace of this. I feel like they've really found something with this comic book and this team is just really killing it. Justin, you might not know this, but Pete and I actually do a pre-interview before the podcast to really prep Smart. him up all his talking points. <laughs> yeah, I was just listening to Alex's notes that he gives me before I talk. It's really good. It was like, keep talking. Don't forget to hate X-Men. <laughs> um, th- this book is such a different flavor from all of Tom King's stuff, talking about Supergirl. And it has a thing. There's almost this Dr. Seussian, like, uh, fantasy novel uh, mm. style to the story where it's all about there's Supergirl. There's so much and- rhyming. And that, there's not much rhyming, but all the aliens that they encounter have, have sort of Seussian elements to me. And there's this almost fantasy type episodic storytelling to the way that uh, Supergirl and her sort of sidekick are wandering through the universe or Xena warrior princess. Um, But at the end, like it's about Supergirl, this like bright shining character having all this darkness underneath. So I'm curious. And she's on this very simple quest for crypto, but it's drudging up all of this like horrible shit. Like I'm curious where we're going to end up. And just as a related thing, I'm also on a search for crypto. So if anybody has like a bead on some real good NFTs or whatever, that would be super sweet. Eat the Rich, number two, speaking of which, from Boom Studios, (laughs) written by Sarah Gailey, art by Pius Bach. We, I think we're very intrigued by the first issue of this. Not 100% sold, but definitely like the art by Pius Bach here. The idea is a woman goes with her boyfriend, potential fiance, but definitely boyfriend to... Aren't all relationships potential fiancés, Alex? I think so. So she goes to visit his family at their rich Hamptons or whatever it is. I really should pay more attention to this book. Yo, I also, you should pay more attention to the world around. You're just like a rich... Um, I don't know. Millionaire so this is a town? comic book with pages and there's some art on it as far as I know. Anyway, she goes and visits the family and finds out at the end of the first issue that they are literally eating the help at the end of the day. That's the thing that she's dealing with in this issue. I think the characters and situations continue to be really good. The way that the main character is dealing with this is very interesting. And there's clearly not only a nuanced discussion going on here of wealth disparity, but also 
leading up to some serious horror and serious turns for the characters. I'm very excited to follow this going forward. Yeah, I feel like this this issue really uh, moved beyond just the simple premise of like, what if uh, rich people were eating uh, poor people and got into uh, sort of grounding that and being like, well, maybe everyone's on board with it uh, and why that would be. So, yeah, I agree with you. I thought the characters were well played. Great issue. I mean, I'm a, I don't disagree with you guys a little bit. I'm not, you know, I don't think it's cool to eat because you're not, you're not but, hungry. Uh, yeah, I'm not pro. You want to eat like, like you want to eat are. the you want to eat the middle class. You don't want to mm-hmm. eat the poor or the rich. Well, I do think that make a choice, know, Pete. Make a choice. I do think it's interesting that if you are going to eat somebody, that you know you you talk it out with that person, and you know maybe you find somebody who's tasty but also wants to die. You know what I mean? So. Uh, it's a tightrope with that walking right now. But you want to ask? Definitely... You want to ask? Are you tasty? Is like number one question. Yeah, that's yeah. on my Tinder profile. Are you tasty? <laughs> want to die? Oh my God, the way you said that, you're killing it you're on there. I'm like, doing great. My wife hates it, but I'm getting a lot of dates. Oh my God, I can't eat <laughs> you guys. Um, yeah, I think it's intriguing. I think uh, it's a, it's a fun kind of twist reveal here. It's great art, so I'm. I, I think they're doing a great job of, of kind of piecemealing the information as they go. So, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna keep checking it out. Pete's hungry for a big old plate of human. And I'll tell you just on apropos of a title we were talking about earlier, Pious Box Art is a very reminiscent of Mark Buckingham in a yeah. really nice way. I uh, really go. like it quite a bit. Let's move on to another book that I'm sure Pete loved, X-Men The Onslaught Revelation Number 1 from Marvel, written by Cy Spurrier, art by Bob Quinn. This is clearly a tie-up for the Way of X comic book and not actually a kickoff for a crossover like I thought it was, as Nightcrawler deals with this onslaught infection that has gone in the X-Men, and in particular, Lollipop Head, Professor X himself. Um, (laughs) I'll tell you what. Lots is going on in this book, and I feel like we've said this before on the podcast, but nobody is better equipped to channel the weirdness of the interstitials of the current X-Men run than Cy Spurrier. And I think he nails it in a way that nobody else does. If you thought Pete didn't like our previous X-Men book, (laughs) buckle up for his take on this X-Men book is my take on what Pete's about to say in a second. But I agree with you, Alex. This comic, this is one of the books that I feel like when they said, hey, we're going to sit in this sort of first act of the X-Men universe. It was like, well, this is the one of the ones that they were like excited about because it's something that takes a very specific part of the current X-Men canon where you are resurrected if you die after like a couple days. We're like, what could we do here that's an interesting, weird storytelling take? And they created this idea that Onslaught has infected people in the middle of their resurrection process. Well, I think it's very be, cool. And- just to interrupt it, for anybody who didn't read it, the, the idea is like, you die, you're an X-Men character, you die, there's a pause before you're re- resurrected. What happens in that time in between, well, what happens is Onslaught takes advantage of you. So, sorry, go ahead, Justin. And, and, uh, yes, and to connect that to what's about happening in Way of X, where Nightcrawler's trying to wrestle with this idea of resurrection, and uh, he's a spiritual character, and, like, what does that mean? Is Do the X-Men need a religion to grapple with these larger life-and-death ideas when they're sort of deathless now? Like, what happens to a soul through this resurrection process? All these big ideas, like... I appreciate they're exploring that and to do this in a sort of superhero way. The book gets perhaps overly complicated at points and really focuses on Fabian Cortez's like problems <laughs> for like so much of it. Everybody's uh, favorite is, X-Men character. Yeah. Uh, but there were some good lines in there about how he's like, my whole power is just juicing up other mutants. I'm a loser. <laughs> uh, but I, I did enjoy this issue because of all the great ideas at play. Then let's turn it over to Pete. Okay, so what the fuck happened in this book? I I, I just explained a lot of it with Alex and I explained Yeah, yeah, I heard you. But to me, this is kind of like really being like, okay, so what if 
there was this kind of like pause between death where maybe there was this weird interdimensional dance party spread page but then we're going to get weird about a bunch of other random things so it's like let's take x-men playing baseball and string that out in kind of the weirdest most fucked up way that makes you question you know like why you would like the x-men in the first place what are you even doing here well, if you think about it, church was the original baseball. Yes, wow. that's a that's a great point. If you think about America's it. America's pastime, mm-hmm. uh, when we first when the well, pilgrims church first, first landed here it was yeah. church. It yeah, was first church. Anyway, I think this was interesting. I'm curious to see what happens next after the end here. But you but, guys could follow this. You were reading this and you were saying this I, makes I sense. Never, I, I never said I could follow it, Pete. Come on. Okay. Right. This is a Cy Spurrier book. It's working five levels above where I am. It's okay. very simple. Legion created a pocket universe, invited several X-Men into a Nightcrawler who is starting his own religion and has been leading the group through that. And they have uh, used Pixie's um, daggers to break people out of uh, Onslaught's control because Onslaught, as we all know, as we said, was uh, finding a different space to um, resurrect the, the mutants and finding the time to infect them with this disease to create a, a disease that would eventually take down Krakoa because that's his ultimate goal. But instead, Nightcrawler's religion was able to drag these people into the Legion pocket universe and find a way to counteract it through Pixie's uh, soul daggers. And they, they ended up just defeating with Fabian Cortez juicing up Sand, a mutant that they had a great power to calling her the Confluence or whatever, because that was a cool nickname. And the fact that her name was Sand is sort of the, the, not cool enough. I'll tell you what, as a little side note before we move on, Onslaught was my initial exit from comics. Like, not for any particular reason, but I remember I when I was in college... I used to be like, no, I'm too cool to read comics now. I don't read comics. And then, hold on. Then at the Hudson News in the Port Authority, I'd be like, well, I got to wait for the bus up to school. I don't know. I got to do something. I guess I'll just read these comics in Hudson News. And I'd stand there for hours in the Hudson News in the Port Authority reading comics. And that's how I read the Onslaught saga initially. And I never got to the last issue. Ah, Like, it just worked out time-wise because of vacations from school. I never found out how it ended. I was like, I don't need to keep up with this. And for years, I didn't read comics after that. Do you know how it ended? The answer may surprise you. Heroes Reborn, right? Yeah, well, that was the... And it's Wait, Magneto it's a... and Xavier's Mind Baby or something like that. That was the, Definitely reading this issue, I was like, what is Onslaught? Baby? What is no, happening? I, I'm pretty sure that's what Onslaught, the reveal, is that it was uh, Professor X's idea, uh, his uh, powers were mind, affected mind by Magneto's, baby. it was the Mind Baby, yes. But isn't it Franklin <laughs> Franklin Richards? Uh, no, Franklin in? Richards saves them and puts them in a pocket universe, which becomes Heroes which Reborn. Which is Heroes right? Reborn. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, and I know that uh, retroactively. Me, <laughs> when that came out, I was like, Franklin Richards saves the day. This kid from the other side of the Marvel universe. I even back then, I was like, I don't know about this. Yeah, guys. I'm out. Thanks. I'll come back a couple of years later and then spend 15 years of my life doing a comic book podcast, but no thanks right now. First of two things, Alex, 15 plus. Uh, <laughs> a, Thank you. And B, some of us never gave up comics. Well, that's even right. Even though you we were in college. <sighs> Woohoo! Never Nightwing number back. 84 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Robbie Rodriguez. Alex, this did is- you read this or did you give it up? <laughs> Are you going to pick this up with the Hudson News? I don't know, man. I was having sex. Nightwing number 84. No. (laughs) (laughs) Kicks off. Nightwing's part of the Fear State crossover. And I'll tell you what, this does actually kind of tie into the discussion we were just having because I have been loving the Nightwing book, and I even think this was solid, but there was a point... Several what? points reading this where I was like, no, let's get back to the main storyline. This is what the main storyline of Nightwing is so good. The, what's going yeah, on right now? Fun. It is fun, but there's a lot of times where he's like, whew, I should really get back to Bloodhaven. Well, anyway, Literally. lots of stuff going on in Gotham City. I'm like, no, go back to Bloodhaven. I want to see that. What are you doing? Go over there. 
hundred percent. He definitely has a whole page where he's like, I know I should deal with stuff in Bloodhaven, but I need to go to Gotham. He might as well said, I know I have to do this crossover, but don't worry. It's only three <laughs> issues. And then I'll be back in dealing with the fun stuff that's going on. Agree with you completely. Still love Nightwing. But this comic, I was like, oh, this is such a step in a totally different direction. No, no, this is a nice kind of break. We know what's happening. It is unbelievable. But this is kind of like a nice little kind of like people get to catch when Batman calls him son. I got choked up. That was there was some really powerful. It's great. It's still a great issue. Tom book. Taylor, Robbie Rodriguez, the writing. They're doing a great book. The Super art's fun. unbelievable. This is a great issue. How dare you, fucking undertake undercut this? This yeah sure. There's a lot of shit going on, but we can still have some nice moments. Uh, Pete, if you put yourself in Nightwing's shoes, do you think it's confusing when Batman calls you son and also Alfred calls you son? Like, which one would you want how to be your dad? You? Which one do you want to be your how dad? How dare you? Alfred or Batman? You could have two dads, bro. What if... Okay. okay. What if Alfred was like, nephew? <laughs> 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 Radiant Black, number eight from Image Comics, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Marcelo Costa. This is bringing the second arc, I think to a close as we fight not our big bad, but somebody who seems to have the same powers or all the powers or is more powerful than all of our radiance, certainly sucking energy off of them. And uh, this continues to be great. I love the characters here. I love seeing them work together. Super fun. It keeps getting weirder, this book. And I appreciate the fact that it's just like, hey, sure, robot arm's going to shoot out of the inside. uh, But we're still having fun character moments when... Uh, our two uh, two of our main characters end up uh, stuck in Russia for a little bit. Like uh, this book continues to surprise me. Yeah, I agree. It's you know we keep getting more and more revelations, and it's doing it in a way that kind of is is cool and kind of explores more. And you you don't feel like all right, yeah, but let's get back to the main thing. I think it's very cool the way this is all kind of unraveling. I'm impressed with the art and the action. This is just a, a continues to be a really solid, cool new book. I'm going to say cool a couple more times. Sounds cool. good to me. Let's move on and talk about Dark Blood, number three from Boob Studios, written by Latoya Morgan, art by Moses Haldalga. Uh, I love this book. This is, first of all, the layouts, the way that it jumps through time throughout these very slow way that we're getting the story of this main character who has some sort of superpowers that are so far not completely defined. It's much more about giving us the span of the life of a man than a superhero origin story. And I really respect that. The way that the the pacing of this comic is so, I, I feel like I haven't read a book like this in a while where they're taking these two timelines happening, jumping back and forth, and then we, we find these points where the action just connects between the two timelines, and mm-hmm. we see them both playing out on the same page, uh, right next to each other, sort of intertwining. Like I was just so impressed by the way that this book uh, told its story. And the story is really interesting. I'm curious where it's going to go, but just the way it was told, I thought was really smart. I, Pete, what I about agree. You? This is just powerful. The art's really unbelievable. The way this kind of flows uh, is really impressive. Uh, it just feels like this team is really uh, uh, knows what it's doing and, and making all the right moves. I've been really impressed with the paneling and the kind of like the flashback toning and stuff like that. So it's you can still follow and kind of figure it out without uh, 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 feeling like too torn between different stories. Very impressive book. Next up, Catwoman number 35 from DC Comics, written by Ram V, art by Nina Vakuva. This issue, we're getting the fallout of the epic battles of the last issue, as well as, of course, I believe, if I remember correctly, a lot of uh, some Fear State stuff as well. Um, uh, I I like this. Uh, Again, like the Nightwing issue, I feel like we don't necessarily need the Fear State stuff because what's going on in Catwoman is interesting enough as is. But I actually do think it works a little better here just because of the emotional connection between Catwoman and Batman. What about you guys? No. Uh, I like this book. Is it no? Sorry, Pete was sipping when I I thought he was going to go first. I. Uh... Yeah, it, it is funny when this book has been sort of separate from the Bat Cat relationship, and in this issue, it was a lot of her being like, "Oh, I I miss uh, I need to go check out this whole did he die situation." Yeah. 
Um, so that sort of caught me off guard. Um, but I, I love the art in this book. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see it go back to more of, uh, again, not to be down on fear state, uh, because I actually like this as a, a piece of the bat universe. Um, but, it, uh, uh just, I want to see Catwoman be herself. Just to bump in for a second. I think we're going to get it and talk about Batman in a second, but I think the fear state again, vent is really smart. It ties into Gotham yeah. city overall. I really like it. I think I'm excited to see how everybody ties into it, but so far the spinoff stuff feels almost like an obligation to do a Batman event versus actually providing crucial pieces of it. Uh, and that's, right. it, it's not even bothering me because I like the issues so much as like, eh, I don't need them. That's okay. You can kind of just go with the main thing and I'm okay with that. It's like if I was having a birthday party and I was like, Pete, I need you to come over and be a part of my birthday party. I need you to be like a clown at my birthday party. You might be like, uh, okay, I sort of have my own life going on here, but I guess I'll come be a clown. Huh. Uh, yeah, I thought this was a uh, just a real badass issue. I, I love the, the art of this, and it's nice to see uh, Catwoman caring for Batman. I think that um, there's been a lot of back and forth here with the cat and the bat, and uh, this one kind of, to me, is, is she saying, uh, Batman needs me, I need to get back. Um, so I'm hoping for a little bit of uh, more closure on their relationship. Uh, Pete, my birthday is in three weeks, and I need you to be a clown. <laughs> yeah, you can go fuck yourself. I don't want to. Okay. Related to that, Stillwater number 10 from idea. Image Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Ramon K. Perez. I don't know. Do we need to go on with that? Do we need to continue? No. Stillwater no, number no. 10. Uh, so this is a game-changing issue for this book, as the entire society over in Stillwater, the town where nobody dies, completely changes by the end of the issue maybe for the better probably for the worse i know we say this almost every issue but i really appreciate this title's devotion to shaking up the premise as hard as possible every time out of the board big swings i would be curious to talk to mr zadarsky to find out if this was the intention from the jump to have the story go here because this definitely feels like an arc that was sort of like let me see what elements are on the table and like, okay, I think I can have it go this way because it's such a surprising way it goes. And uh, really, like you're saying, Alex, it's a whole new world at the end of this issue. A whole new world. Yeah, I thought this was uh, kind of a crazy uh, a swerve a little bit, but also very interesting and cool to kind of get this backstory to something that we saw. So uh, yeah, I think it still continues to be an amazing book. The art's unbelievable. Um, and also there's like a, uh, an ad for a Rick Remender book that I can't wait to see in the, in the back of this. Right yeah. That was my favorite part as well. Badges. Oh man. Slap that cool. on the cover. Yeah. Pretty cool. Great ads. <laughs> yeah. Black oh, Hammer Visions. What, I'm what's sorry. Up? We can't, we can't talk about things that are in the comic. You know, we can't just say, no, like, no, no, no. Oh, I'm Listen, I'm, I'm psyched for a new Rick Remender book too. I just Honestly, know. guys. Did you check out the UPC code? Because the the lines were so tight. Oh. So, so close to each did other. We, did we talk about the staples? Because I thought the staples were really the thing <laughs> holding it together. Uh, Ooh, Ooh, Alex, good night. Black Hammer Visions number eight from Dark Horse Comics, written by Scott Snyder, art by David Rubin. Here we're getting, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name of the DC character it's like the red mask or something like that. Basically, it's somebody who's drawn by their guns to vengeance. And we're getting the Black Hammer riff on that in this issue. Very well done Western story into timelines. Every issue of this is interesting to read. I, I This is a good book. Pete, what do you think? Yeah, this is uh, it continues to be such an interesting thing uh to explore uh I, the, this whole kind of like black hammer world and uh, <laughs> i when you they opened up the coffin and you saw the bullets and the guns it's just really cool and badass looking so i was i i continue to be impressed with these uh books and i think this is no exception 
kind of a cool, interesting art style where it goes back and forth between indie to more mainstream, but uh, very, very cool. Are you talking about the the DC character Vigilante, who is in the Justice League Unlimited series? Maybe is... He has uh, guns. No, he... it's not Vigilante. I'll look it up. You talk about Black Hammer Visions. Uh, I liked this book a lot as well. I mean, this is Scott Snyder bringing some of his flavor to the universe. Um, but I, I, as much as we uh, love Scott Snyder, I do think the art was such a standout here. Oh, um, yeah. It felt like it had a nice western flavor while also still being a uh, superhero as it went crimson avenger that's who i was thinking of mm. it's a character who shows up in jsa and a couple of other books moving on though as we teased earlier batman number 113 from dc comics written by james town the fourth brandis thomas art by jorge jimenez and jason howard here we're dealing with the main fear state story in the front of the book as batman is grappling with a war on multiple fronts. Simon Saint, the peacekeeper, Scarecrow, shutting down the whole city. In the backup story, we're getting Clown Hunter, which I think, Justin, you and I called out as a standout in the last issue. But what did you think about this one? Since we've been, I don't think down, but necessarily mixed about the fear state of the other books, how did you feel about the main book? Uh, I it's great. I mean, I think uh, Jamestown and the Fourth is really putting the philosophy out here of this uh, crossover and this arc. When we get um, Orphan Maker sort of revealing a uh, a backstory he had with with Scarecrow, which was cool. Were you talking about Ghostmaker? Or sorry, Ghostmaker, Orphan Maker. I keep saying that. Um, similar idea though. Yeah, right. ghosts and You're orphans are. I'm just trying You're to help you out. Orphans. I wasn't trying to undercut you. I was just trying. No, you, please. I want. I want the help. In the same way um, that I want a clown for my birthday party, I'm a clown hunter. In a lot of ways, just wow. like the backstory in this book. Good and luck. Pete, you're the, and you're the like clown. And just like you're talking I'm about, hunting. I went to the ghost village to adopt a ghost the other day, and they told me no, I was not fit as a ghost parent. The ghost finish. <laughs> the ghost finish, yes. I shouldn't have started uh, with that one. I should have led up to it. <laughs> um, but I, I do think, it, and again, I, maybe I'm just feeling the future loss, the fear lo of the loss of James Tynan from Batman. Uh, I'm in a fear state, is what I'm saying. Oh. Pete? Yeah, I, th I thought this was great. Um, we're kind of getting some answers here, and I love the backstory stuff. We're getting with uh, Batman and Ghostmaker. So, yeah, I, I I also like this hyping up the kind of Scarecrow battle that's to come. Uh, I thought this was kind of like a good kind of like, all right, let's kind of like check in before the big kind of push for the finale. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciated this. The storytelling's all kind of moving forward in and, uh, and, and interesting ways. I'll tell, tell you, you credit for really taking it to the future state story. Like, it's real in Gotham City now. Yeah, I really like that aspect quite a bit. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I kind of feel like I don't know which direction they're heading in, or maybe they have announced any, something already, but Brandon Thomas and Jason Howard's backups are so good. Give them the main yeah. title. Give them Batman after this. Wow. I want to see what wild directions they take him in. That's maybe where we're headed. Yeah, they're in the back. Awesome. That's what, how the time in the fourth did it. Yeah, there you go. Chew number eight from Image Comics, written by John Layman and art by Dan Boltwood. In this issue, our main character is dealing with the ramifications of drinking wine that takes you back in time, and she's figuring that out. Another great issue of this book. So creative, so funny, so uh, d much darker, you know, in a way than Chew C H E W, the original title. Pete, what would you think about this one? Yeah, I agree. It's a, uh, it's kind of a darker, but it's not. It, there's also humor and like, uh, I loved all the punching. That was a fun, uh, reoccurring bit. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is such a cool kind of like heightening of the other two series in in a way that's enjoyable. Uh, I also like this a lot. I'm surprised by how much I like it because I wasn't a big fan of Chew, the EW version. Um, and, and it really resonates with me because I feel like whenever I drink wine, I time travel to 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Next up, Superman, Son of Kal-El, number three from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by John Timms. In this issue, Jonathan Kent is dealing with the imminent departure of Superman from Earth, possibly forever. He is also grappling with his own social responsibility as the new Superman. Justin, curious to hear from you. Each issue of this so far has been a very different thing. How are you feeling about this title three issues in? Well, it feels like it's moving forward quickly. We get at the back end of this issue sort of a very emotional exchange between um, John and Superman, his father. And Thanks, uh, it is running on two tracks, sort of. There's the, sort of, the idea that the son of Kal-El, our new Superman, is sort of like, I want to be a more socially conscious. I want to go out yeah. and, and help people around the world, not just stop criminals. At the same time, the emotional uh, situation where um, John knows that his father is going to leave for space, never to return according to his time in the future when he would re read back into history. So that's a lot to deal with. And this book is sort of jumping back and forth, but I feels like we're going to move firmly into what this new Superman's take on the world is next issue. Uh I, I disagree with Justin a little bit. I think it's more enjoyable than he's letting on. I, I think that this is a very cool way to kind of pass the mantle. And I also love this idea of if we're going to get a new Superman, like what are they kind of standing for and what's important to them? And like getting in on this kind of like social justice and like <coughs> standing up for people on the uh, ground instead of just fighting aliens in the sky is a cool thing that they can move forward with with this character, which is very exciting uh, f for Superman. So I I'm, I'm very happy with how this is all kind of unfolding. And from just like the title of it and what was going on, I was a little worried about it. But I've been really impressed with the choices that they're making along the way. Uh, but also just very touching, powerful moments and amazing art to kind of really punctuate these father-son stuff. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I, maybe I'm on the same page as you, Justin, just in terms of I'm excited to get past the Superman leaving thing. So we see John on his own and figure out who he is as a hero. I mentioned this before, but Tom Taylor killed it with X-Men Red, which is the X-Men mm. dealing with social responsibility and real social issues. So... I'm very excited to see how that pans out. The villain is really good. The cliffhanger is harrowing oh, here. Man. So it should be really interesting to follow the series going forward. It feels like it's just getting started. And last but not least, that Texas Blood, number 10, from Image Comics, written by Chris Condon, art by Jacob Phillips. This is starting to round out our cult arc of the series. Justin... I believe this was your most anticipated book of the week. Talk about this one. This is my favorite of the week. I really like um, the way that this comic is sort of, sh it's shifting our timeline completely. We're telling a story from 1981 and the, rem the ramifications of that as they're dealing with the case they're currently dealing with. And I love this backstory. It's sort of tense, dark, sad. We just get a great breakaway moment where um the sheriff back in 1981 tells this horrifying story it just had a ton of great elements the art is just so simple and and, and basic clean uh i i just love the way this book is moving pete what about you yeah very powerful issue i love that mom losing her shit on that fucking cop uh just great just really kind of like powerful stuff i think this is just artistically unbelievably done where you see that kid laying there laughing and then like the panel and then you see him dead just oh jesus that'll that'll fucking get your attention if you're a fan of the ed brubaker sean phillips verse um this is the comic for you yeah and just a specific shout out to jacob phillips on this issue as pete was saying his art is phenomenal here and making it clear what's going on in two timelines is a hard thing to do but his art does it extremely well. 
If you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comics. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show. Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. One last shout out if you want to be at my birthday party coming up. I'm going to send, I'm going to send Pete the makeup. Um, if we can all just work to getting him to apply it appropriately and really clown it. Alex.